Welcome to the Elevate Everyday Podcast. I'm your host, Cade Junkerth, and I own Fitness Junkie Training. And today I've got another badass guest on the podcast. We've got Chris on here. Uh, he owns Champ Up, and this dude has a really important and inspirational message. And he's also a, uh, a Muay Thai fighter, and he's competed for America in Thailand. Um, super badass guy. Uh, really had a good time connecting with him before the podcast. So really excited to to have him share his message with you guys and hopefully inspire you and provide a lot of value to you. So first and foremost, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, Chris. And why don't you just, you know, tell your story because it's very inspirational. Um, just, just tell the listeners kind of your, your background and your story, my man. So uh, yeah, let's go back to, I guess, New York, Queens, right? I was born and raised in Queens. I actually lived in New York for 47 years before I moved recently. Uh, but I came up um, in Elmhurst, Queens originally. And uh, my parents are immigrants from the Philippines. And we lived in, you know, an apartment building in Elmhurst. And my parents decided they wanted to live more of the American dream and buy a home. So they moved us only about 10 miles away uh, when I was about eight or nine years old. And yeah, my let to say my whole life was flipped upside down. You know, yeah, that that's um, that's definitely uh, the start of the journey right there. Just moving only uh, again, not not too far away, but everything flipped upside down. And, you know, I was a, a new kid in school. Uh, the new kid in the neighborhood, the pretty much the only Filipino American kid in my school in the neighborhood. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say that's where life started. I have two two younger brothers, and obviously my my parents. And yeah, one, once I moved to to this other part of Queens, uh, I felt like you know I, again I was uh, the only Filipino American kid in my school, so I was getting bullied, you know, on a regular basis. I would you know, get tripped down the stairs, I would get, you know, the food knocked out of my hands in the lunchroom. And but worse than all that was actually, uh, you know, my home life, uh, you know, my dad, he was, uh, uh, he was pretty much uh, in in the household, he was present, but he was absent, meaning he was totally uh, detached from my family. And that that, um, that made for um uh, what I call father trauma in, in my life. And I know a lot of, you know, a lot of other people out there experience father trauma in different ways. But for me, that was a, a huge um, uh, turning point in, 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 you know, at eight, eight or nine years old. Gotcha. Well, so I, first of all, I, I appreciate you sharing kind of just, you know, your background, um, getting bullied and everything like, like that. I'm sure it, brings up tough memories and also, you know, at your home life, um, you know, were you a smaller kid? Do you like, were you able to kind of defend yourself back then whenever you were getting bullied and, and stuff like that? Like, um, were, were you, do you kind of like a smaller guy or did that kind of inspire your, your Muay Thai journey? Is that part of, um, what inspired you to get into MMA and everything? Uh, I, w I would say, I would guess I was just the average, you know, I wouldn't say I was small or, or, you know, big for my age, but yeah, I would say I was average, but it was more so, I think just my mentality. I, I was just scared. I was scared okay. to stick up for myself and speak up for myself. Right. And, um, well, what, what got me into martial arts, interestingly enough, was my dad. Okay. My dad, uh, was a martial artist and he actually, he brought me down to the dojo uh, one of the few times that we've ever connected in my life. And he was the one that exposed me to martial arts training at around eight or nine years old. And that was the art of uh, Taekwondo. Awesome. Yeah. So that's that's well, one good thing. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, but you know, what happened, uh, you know, once I, you know, started, you know, trying to convince my mom to try to join up in Taekwondo, it took a few years or a couple of years for that to happen. I, I started training myself and my dad, you know, pretty much gave up on it. And I always wonder, you know, was that my fault? Did I, did I infringe on something that was personal to him? You know, even though I wasn't training at the same dojo, you know, was that something that, you know, that 
pushed him out of of training martial arts because he never trained again after I started. I mean, you know, it it could be, you know, he saw something in you that he didn't see in himself. I mean, in it, but that's not something that you can control. You know, what I mean, that's that's not something you should feel guilty for or anything like that. You know, that he's a grown man and everything. So, but. But yeah, I mean, you obviously have a lot of potential. So he he was maybe just like, <laughs> I would I would almost think like discouraged. Like, man, maybe he saw how much potential you had. He didn't see that he had that potential for himself. And it's almost like, you know, what's the point? Like, <laughs> so that that could be part of it. That's that's just something that comes to mind for me. Um, but I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that, and I never I never thought of it in that way. Maybe yeah, maybe it was uh you know, maybe it was discouraging for him. Right. I, I don't know, but you know, I, I, I didn't let those thoughts sit for too long. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know, maybe around 13 or 14, I was just like, you know what, that's yeah. Like you said, that's his decision, right. but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give my all to this, you know, because it, it's what gave me life. Uh, but, you know, it was interesting to be able to see him come to life, you know, when he was in the dojo for that one time, because when he was at home, he was, you know, basically, to me, he was uh, like an inanimate object. He would sit at the kitchen wow. table and basically, you know, do nothing and, and try to figure out a way to win the lotto or bet on a horse. My dad, wow. you know, w- was a gambling addict during those times of my life. And that that was uh, discouraging to see, but it, it was my, it, it turned into my motivation into my my purpose right okay well what, do you think your your experience at home with with your father growing up and you know going to a new school getting bullied do you think that's what's drawn you or what, what has drawn you because i've looked at your content and you're all about you know inspiring the youth and everything like that like where does that come from yeah i would say it, it comes from that that my childhood you know just okay. you know not having a strong a strong father figure. Uh, I didn't have any mentors. I mean, I love my mom. My mom did her best, but she was limited in her, you know, energy and her emotions to be able to try to compensate for the loss of, you know, my dad not being involved in the family. So I would say, yeah, definitely my childhood of feeling a lot of pain and suffering. I feel like my mission has always been to try to give back, to make sure that, I was going to be the person that maybe another kid, you know, or, you know, I wanted to be the dad that some kids might not have in their lives or, or a mentor or not, not, not even a dad, just a mentor or a guide for kids that might be lost and might be going through the same, you know, father trauma, because, uh, you know, it's statistically, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty sad what happens to, to kids, you know, boys, especially that don't have a, a father figure in their life. You know, they, they, they do the things that I did growing up. You know, I, I made a lot of decisions that were heading, you know, putting me on a, on a really uh, self-destructive path. So what, what uh, flipped the switch for you? So you said you're, you're making some bad decisions. Like what, what was the turning point? When did it flip for you? Oh man, it, it flipped uh, a little late in life, literally in my early twenties, okay. where you know I had already been running the streets and and doing things that were getting me in trouble and putting other people potentially in trouble. Where I got into a street fight that I, I could have avoided, and it was again, it was all ego, you know, a young, you know, you know, full of testosterone or early twenties, and I thought the way for me to prove myself in my neighborhood was to, to prove how tough I was. So I I chose to involve myself in a street fight with somebody who was bigger and better than me. And he busted me up pretty good. And it, it definitely, you know, even at an early age, uh, put me in what I, you know, what, what's considered, you know, ex- existential crisis. I, I questioned, you know, myself as a human being, as a man, and, and as a, as a martial artist as well, because, at that point in time, I had I had given up Taekwondo for a good seven years, but I already had, you know, years of Taekwondo training from when I was a kid. So, yeah, I would say that was the turning point for me, for sure. Okay. And then you went on to basically be a, 
a world competitor Muay Thai fighter in and own your own gym, right? With Muay Thai clients and everything. Um, so you've obviously accomplished a lot and, you know, what can you tell maybe someone that's going through some early trauma or maybe they have things that have happened to them in the, in the past that, you know, they can't get through, they haven't really worked through yet. Like how can someone turn a negative upbringing or past trauma into a superpower and maybe even have it, you know, drive them and, and have them accomplish even more, like use it as a source of fuel. I would say, you know, if it always first starts out with the way you talk to yourself, you know, I, I tell this to, you know, I share this with the kids at the presentations, like our lives are dictated by the way we talk to ourselves. If we talk to ourselves in a, in a negative way, most likely that's what's going to come up for us in our life. And if we change that, or we, if we flip the script, then we can literally change our lives and take whatever hardship comes up or we've experienced or disappointment and use that, like you said, as, as our fuel, because, you know, at eight years old, uh, I'll, I'll never forget this. This has just been uh, top of mind forever that when I, I used to watch my dad just sit there and do nothing all day, real, literally, you know, I remember saying to myself as an eight or nine year old, I was like, I I'm going to do something, you know, to bring some recognition to my family's name because my dad wasn't doing it right. He was just sitting there and, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how, or I didn't know what I was going to do at that age, but I just knew that saying that in my head, you know, it kind of set me on a path and it opened up my world to think about, all right, what can I do to make sure that I'm being somebody of significance in my life? Right. And I've, I've lived by that, you know, that one moment of self-talk in my life since, you know, again, for 40, 40 years. That's awesome. Yeah. I think self-talk is huge. Um, you know, for, for some people I know, cause I, I had an, I'll be honest, like I, I can't really relate for myself. I had great parents who like, honestly, like instilled a lot of confidence in me and, you know, helped me with my own self-talk and things like that. But I know people personally that had tough upbringings. And I, I know that even at my age now, you know, they're my age, at 28, 29, 30 years old, um, that they, they still struggle with these things. Um, so are there any things that you think someone can like tactically and practically do to improve their self-talk? Like I know for me, um, even though I don't sh necessarily struggle from, from trauma in the past or, or things like that for my upbringing, um, journaling has just helped me a whole lot. Um, and, it, and it's improved my own self-talk. It's almost like I've become my own, um, like life coach in a way. Um, but is there anything that you've found for yourself or, or maybe some of your clients or people you just know personally or work with, um, that, that they could use to, to help them with their own self-talk? Yeah, I, w I would say the first thing is awareness, right? Yeah. You know, being aware of what the thoughts are going on inside of your head, because we, we have anywhere between, 10,000 and 20,000 thoughts that run through our mind every day. You know, that's, that's what scientists say. And being aware of those thoughts, like when something comes up, like, Oh, either whatever, I'm so stupid or man, you know, I, I can't look at myself in the mirror. I can't stand looking at myself in the mirror, like whatever self talk comes up, like address it right then and there. Like, okay. You know, ask yourself, how true is this? Right. And then I call it, you know, for the kids, I say, flip the script, all right? If you're thinking, you know, if you're saying to yourself, I'm stupid, like, all right, how about trying, like, all right, I might not know the answer yet, but I'll find the answer, right? Yeah. So I would say, uh, and like what you were saying, like um, journaling, but having a gratitude journal, be appreciating, you know, I do this every night. I write down five things that I'm, I'm grateful for so yeah. that, you know, you're not going to sleep thinking about the things that didn't go well in your day, you're think you're going to sleep thinking about the things that did go well. Right. And that, you know, that puts you in this pattern of thinking, okay, you know, challenging things or, or negative things are going to happen, but there's always going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a positive thing to match that. Right. So yeah. I would say definitely writing, you know, writing things down for, for years, I would write down, uh, some people call them, affirmations, I call them declarations. Like I'm declaring, this is what I want. 
you know, and this is how I want to live my life. Right. Do they always work? No, but again, it's better than just letting your mind do its own thing and not trying to guide it or, or steer it in, in some way or another, because literally it's the most, you know, the mind is the most powerful thing that we have control over. Right. right. And we do, we, some people don't realize we have complete control over the way we think, mm -hmm. you know, it's the only thing we have control over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's funny. The listeners, you're probably noticing a pattern. Like every guest I've had on here has said they do gratitude journaling so far. So it's just, <laughs> it's, if you're not doing this yet, you, you need to do it. Like, you know, write things down that you're grateful for. This is, I think the easiest and quickest pathway to a more positive mindset. Um, and yeah, just think, seeing things that in a different perspective, right? So super powerful. It's awesome that you do that as well. Um, I want to know like what has MMA and working out in general done for you? For, for me personally, um, you know, I, I feel like I've got an addictive personality. I've talked about this on some of my social media. Um, I've, I've struggled with alcohol in the past and just, you know, in general, I just feel like working out has created a really good outlet for me um, that I can almost become addicted to something that's healthy in a way. And it's, it's just had a lot of positive outcomes in my life. So, so what is kind of MMA um, and working out exercising done for you in your life? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, just like you, man, if, if not for exercise or what I call physical culture, like when I was a kid and I would, you know, get bullied at school, I would run home. I wouldn't go inside my house because I didn't really want to be around my dad and, and his uh, toxic energy. I would run into my garage. Right. And I would, you know, I set up a pull-up bar in my garage. My mom bought me a heavy bag uh, you know, and I would, you know, I, I would do push-ups and squats. So, you know, physical activity helped me, you know, mentally and emotionally, right? It gave, like you, it gave me an outlet for all the anger and the frustration that I had had as a kid. And it put me on a path for, look at where I am now. I mean, I've, I was a personal trainer. I owned the gym and I, you know, I became a, a professional athlete. So it gave me a, a direction in life. So, I would say it's, it was crucial, you know, to keep me on a straight and narrow path, you know, because just like you, you know, abusing alcohol could have been my lifelong, you know, that could have been my lifelong fix. Right. But I, I turned that into a constructive, you know, I turned that energy from abusing alcohol into not abusing my body, but building my body up, you know, and in turn building my mental my me mental fortitude and my emotional fortitude, you know? I, so I would say it was, it turned me into not only a better human being, it turned me into a better son yep. for my mom, a better husband, you know, because I didn't know what it meant to be a husband for a long time. And now I feel like, you know, I, I'm just scratching the surface on trying to be the best husband that I can be and also being the best dad that I can be. So Man, yeah, f working out uh, or martial arts, Muay Thai, whether it's jujitsu, boxing, or wrestling, it it puts you, like I said, on this straight and narrow path. Which, you know, when you get lost, because it happens, we all get lost at moments in our life. At least you have a road to come back to to get right. you know put you put you back on your journey. Yeah. That's awesome. And yeah, I think there's so many lessons that can be learned through your fitness journey that kind of parallel some of those other things you were mentioning with relationships and even your career, you know, other areas of life, there's different principles and skill. I, I would call them skills, like even discipline, I would call it's a skill you can learn, you can learn it through fitness and things like that. So um, I think there's so many parallels, so many lessons to be learned. And like you said, I think that's very powerful where it can help you you know, work through certain things you're going through in your life. Well, I was just thinking about this today. It's like, even when I'm having a bad day, it's just, it's something that I know I can control and, and kind of make one positive out of that day. So say, you know, you, you had a bad work day, you know, something happened with a client, whatever, you know, or, or you got in a fight in your relationship, whatever it is, like, you know, you can always kind of have this outlet that you can go to. And it's like one positive thing that you can always be working on. So that that's one thing that kind of speaks to me, um, piggybacking off of, off of what you said. So, 
Um, yeah, yeah, no, I agree because, uh, you know, I, I, I believe in the concept that everything is energy, right? And if you're feeling low energy, whether it's some challenge that you've got going on in your life, once you step foot, you know, in your gym, you know, in your home gym or another gym or on the mats, like that energy gets shifted automatically. Like yeah. maybe the first five minutes that you walk in the gym, you're like, oh, I don't really want to do this. But then once you start moving and sweating and breathing heavy or, you know, for martial arts, you know, somebody's like trying to choke you out or you're like throwing kicks and punches at each other, the whole energy shifts and it just it can literally yeah, change your change your day, change your hour, change your life. You know? 100%. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So complete shift, but I'm curious just because we talked about it a little bit, but where is yours and your father's relationship now? Has it has have has that been repaired? Is that are you guys completely distant from each other? Where where are you at with that? Well, that, that's actually a really good question. Uh interestingly enough, my father now is uh in in physical and health decline. Okay. Uh, not nothing serious, but uh, he's he's getting older. He's 84 years old. Uh, I would not say that we've uh, mended our relationship. I think we're at a point where, you know, we've just accepted. Uh, for me, I've accepted, uh, you know, the 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 history of our relationship, and I'm not actively trying to fix that because, you know, again, it's it's way. I would say we've I've hit the point of no return. I mean, a lot of people that might be listening could be saying, "Yeah, you you could do something about it," but you know, I, I've I've come to the acceptance that, you know, even though my dad wasn't there, like in a verbal or emotional, and a fit, oh, he was there physically, but not in an emotional or a verbal way. He's taught me a lot, right? I, I would not be the person that I am right now, if not for the relationship that we had and still have. And, but on that note, I still go out of my way to be of service to my family. Like I live, uh, I live out of state. And if my, if my father needs to get to a doctor's appointment, or if my mom needs some kind of help with my dad, who's struggling, like I'll, I'll go out of my way to be of service to him. But it's, it's at that point where it's just, okay, I'll, I'll be the son, uh, you know, even though he wasn't there for me, I'm not going to hold it against him because, you know, he just didn't have the information to, to be the dad that he wanted to be. Because again, you know, it's been a cycle in my, in my, in my family that my grandfather was the same way, even though I never met the guy, you know, from hearing stories, my grandfather was the same. So it just makes sense that my dad would carry himself in that way. But I know for a fact that I've broke the cycle in, in the fatherhood uh, challenge in my family. So Good for you, good for you, man. That's awesome. And then, yeah, you probably learned, you know, what, what to do and what not to do from him. Right. So that's, it's probably made you a better father in some ways for sure. Um, gotcha. Well, yeah. I, I wouldn't say I'm perfect. You know, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I've obviously I've, I'm on this journey. I'm learning, you know, I, I make mistakes. I, I haven't, I haven't figured it all out by any means, but yeah, I, I know every single day. I know we spoke about this, uh, our first talk, but you know, 1% better. I'm trying to do 1% better every single day. What, what are you focused on right now? Like, what do you think is your main areas of improvement um, that you're trying to get that? I mean, obviously, you know, we're all trying to get better in, in our career, fitness, relationships, but what are you specifically kind of honing in on right now? Curious. So from being in this uh, journey of, of what I call healing and self-recovery from, you know, for years now, not, not just recently, what I'm learning because of the lack of communication or toxic communication that I grew up with, I'm not, I'm not the best communicator and I'm not the best with uh, relationships. So I would say what I'm working on is how to be a better communicator and building stronger relationships, whether it's family, friends, or, or, you know, or, you know, associates and things like that. Uh, because again, what, what I grew up with was a lack of communication in my household 
or sometimes just you know toxic communication okay yeah now you're now you're a speaker so you're yeah yeah leaning into it so that, that's awesome well cool yeah. so i wanted to ask you you know in a world full of i feel like negativity and kind of just like attention sucking social media and everything these days like how can the listeners cultivate more positivity in their life hmm how can the listeners cultivate more positivity? I mean, I, I I really believe it goes back to, you know, what we were talking about early, earlier journaling, you know, and writing down your thoughts, but also uh, getting quiet, right? Like literally trying to detach from, you know, social media and all these outside influences. And I would say not being scared of what's going on inside, because I think what a lot of people do uh, with so you know, with distraction, you know, whether it's social media or anything else, is that they they want to try to drown out the the thoughts and the feelings that are going inside. Right. But I really believe, like, whatever emotions and feelings that might be coming up, whether they're whether they're painful or not, like, sit with it and really try to understand yourself. Right. So I would say deep deep introspection, man. I would say that's definitely been the theme for me over the last few years, ever since, you know, I closed my gym down uh, during pandemic, you know, that, that loss of the gym, the loss of identity as, as a gym owner, like I lived that identity for close to, well, a a decade, you know, that was who I was. And for that to not be in my life, uh, I I was, I was definitely in pain. You know, I, I would say, you know, the, you know, the dictators who are taking over, you know, I call, I, I have this concept of the seven dictators, you know, self-doubt, fear, disappointment, hardship, confusion, ego, and self-talk try to hold us down when things, you know, when things are happening, but, you know, sitting with that and saying, okay, I'm feeling this self-doubt. I'm feeling this fear. Like, all right, now what can I do to take that and say, move how can i move forward how can i flip the script yeah you know so i would say you know sit with the emotions and the feelings that you're that you're experiencing and say okay i'm a human being i'm allowed to feel this but now what can i do to not let it hold me down but use it like you said as fuel to move yeah. forward yeah i think that's very powerful i think self awareness um is lacking these days because a lot there's so many distractions you can just distract yourself from your own awareness right and there there's so many things to just get quick dopamine hits where everything's just so accessible and there's so many things to be able to distract us and entertain us that i think we instead of sitting with ourselves having that introspection which i kind of went through that myself um you know when the when the gym shut down because at the time i was working in a gym as well so and that's when i kind of transitioned towards the online training now i'm doing just all online um but i i went through the same thing at the time it was just like wow this is this is my kind of identity i, I basically live in a gym right now and when it all shut down it was like man things can be just taken from you in an instant like you, you're not in control of everything um and it kind of sent me down that kind of introspective path as well um but yeah, I can definitely resonate with that. And I think just sitting with your thoughts, having deep introspection, I think that can be super powerful. Um, I just read the book Deep Work by Cal Newport. So I think not only introspection, but also like for your for your productivity as well, like removing a lot of distractions can be very helpful. It's it's opened my eyes reading this book on how much I distract myself because I was kind of just like paying attention to all these little things that I do. And, and yeah, I, I think everyone it has way too many distractions right now and it's causing us to um, kind of ignore some of that introspection and awareness. Um, and I think it can be super powerful if you can find a way to um, get rid of a lot of those distractions and then just, you know, make sure that you are cultivating more positive distractions when you do or not distractions, but more positive um, media when you do consume things, you know, I think that can be super powerful and I think can change your thoughts a lot, right. When, when you are having that, those introspections, um, because you're feeding yourself with positivity instead of that negativity. So I think that's very, yeah, Yeah, no, I, I definitely appreciate that. And I, I would say the, the way 
I've been able to do that is, you know, I moved from New York into New Jersey. Uh, and where I live now, I mean, it's a complete 180 from where, you know, I, I lived in Metro New York City for 47 years. And now I'm literally, I'm living by a lake, you know, surrounded by trees. And uh, I would say being out in nature, you know, what helped me a lot through, uh, you know, the past few years, because learning how to appreciate just the simple things, right? Simple, the trees in the morning when, when you see the sun coming up over the hills or, you know, I, you know, for years growing up in New York, I, I didn't appreciate nature. And now I, I truly, I love going out for like a trail run. I did a yeah. six mile trail run the other day and no headphones, you know, I run, you know, just trying to absorb, you know, my surroundings. And yeah. I feel like for anybody that is not sure of how to uh, block out, you know, these distractions, I, I would say, take a trip into nature, you know, sit by, sit by a stream or, you know, I know it's tougher in Texas, depending on where you are, but, you know, get out in nature and get out in the woods and leave your phone at home. Well, use your phone for GPS, obviously, because you don't want to get lost, but, you know, you know, shut everything else down and just sit there and, you know, let your thoughts go. And then, you know, I, I like to think of your thoughts like clouds in the sky. You know, if you were just sitting there watching the clouds, you notice a cloud, right? You don't, you know, you don't get hyper-focused on one cloud. You kind of just let them go by and just like, all right, well, you know, what's next, you know, what's next in the sky. So let your thoughts just go, you know, uh, be aware of it, accept it, and then, you know, move on to the next thought. And who knows what comes up, you know, so many things have come up for me on, you know, just walking through the woods or running through the woods. Yeah. You know, you know so yeah, I would say that would be one way for for your listeners to, uh, you know, detach from, from social media or technology. 100%. Yeah, I used to be all about like, you know, podcasts, audiobooks all the time. And obviously you still want to consume some good educational content. But yeah, I think when you can choose sometimes when you just completely disconnect, those those are some of the times, like you said, where some of my best ideas and thoughts come up. It's like, because you can just more clearly, that's how you can think, right? If you're not just putting more information into your mind, like you, your mind's able to just um, flow and, and think a little bit better and clearer in times like that. So and I think I read in the, in that, uh, deep work book that literally what you were talking about where things are just passing by there's like a there's a specific benefit to that like that your brain um benefits from where where there's even a word for it and i'm forgetting what it is but when things are like passing you by on the side and you're you have more stimulus outside and you're just um but you keep walking or running forward like there's a benefit to your brain when that's happening so i think that's super interesting that you brought that up and it's just intuitive for you that you notice that um but yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to pick up that book now because yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds it sounds interesting. It's a good book. It definitely because yeah. I, I, I caught myself like you're distracting yourself way too much after I read this book. <laughs> That's how I felt. So um, but yeah, so I want to wanted to ask you, like, what does champ up really mean? Because I, I know your whole um, whenever you're giving these speeches and everything, it's like champ up. What What does that mean to you? So champ up is uh, this concept that I came up with when I wrote, I wrote a book, a memoir and back in 2017 okay. and, and the book is called champions uprising nice. and uh, the concept, well, it, it's a, it's a memoir of my, of my life through the fighting years and growing up and, and through, uh, you know, owning the gym. Uh, but my thought is my, my philosophy is that we're all champions. We're all born with a champion spirit. Mm -hmm. but life, you know, the dictators hold us down. And I truly believe that if we can uprise against these dictators, then we can keep moving forward no matter what challenges come up. So champ up is basically short for champions uprising. It's the moment that you accept, you know, the, the challenges of life, not, not the stuff that's going on outside, but the stuff that's going on inside of us. And you accept those challenges and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to keep fighting on. I'm going to, I'm going to live my life as a champion and be able to, to battle self-doubt, fear, disappointment, hardship, confusion, ego, and self-talk. So for the kids, 
you know, it's really resonated well because every time I go for a speech like that's one of the main things that the kids, you know, after, after the talk, I do a Q and a, and kids are always asking questions about like, all right, so what can I do against, you know, fear? What can I do against, you know, what can I do when my ego is getting the best of me? Or what can I do to, you know, like you asked, like, how can you shift, you know, self-talk? So yeah, champ up is that moment where you're saying, okay, the life, the fight is not outside of me. It's inside of me. So now how can I, champ up and keep moving forward right that's awesome i want to lean into the ego um talker the ego point because one thing i've um, heard of recently and, and kind of thought about is how having an ego can actually you know people think it means like you're cocky or, or things like that but you know it can actually cause you to to not you know give your best self or maybe not show up on social media, stuff like that. Like your ego is in the way. Um, so there's different kind of definitions of ego or what, what people think of it. Uh, but how does someone get rid of their ego or minimize their ego to, to, to get past that and, you know, really show their best self to the world. So there's this saying, you know, in the martial arts world, maybe even, uh, maybe even the fitness world, uh, but, you know, leave your ego at the door. Right. And I say, no, I say, you, you know, when you step in, in, in a gym or on the mats, you need a little bit of ego to challenge yourself. Like if you had no ego at all, like you'd, you'd be sitting home, you'd be thinking about it. You'd be like, ah, oh, I don't know if I can do that. So I tell the kids like, you know, or I'll tell the listeners, you, you need a little bit of ego to put yourself on the journey of whatever goal you're striving for. But you don't want to have a big ego and think that you know it all and you don't have to work hard for things and that'll just come to you because when you have a big ego, you know, what happens, you know, what happens to the fighter that has a big ego? It's cocky. <laughs> yeah, they got, and they, and nine times out of 10, they get smashed because yeah. their ego is too big. So I, I always try to get the kids to realize that you want to have a balanced ego, right? One that can kind of, you know, uh, shift, right? So I would say the best way to do that is just understand that, you know, you're a human being, you're going to make mistakes, but you're also a human being that doesn't know it all, that you have room for growth, yeah. right? We all, you know, we all have the ability to learn and absorb and, and evolve. And once you think you know it all, that could be the downfall of, you know, you know, your existence, right? Your, your learning and your growing and your, your inspiration or your motivation. Yeah. Right. So I would say main thing is just understanding that ego is, it fluctuates, that it's not fixed. You don't have to have just a big ego or, you know, maybe you're not feeling, you, you don't feel confident by yourself. You don't just have to stay in that low, you know, low sense of ego. You want to find a way to find some balance with your ego. Hope like, that answered your question. Yeah, I like that. What what that made me think of is there's been certain times in my life where um, I would call it like, and this is a term that I've heard before as well. I, I read it somewhere, but I've had like ego death where I've gone through like a an experience that has showed me <laughs> like you're not all that you think you are. And it's like, it's kind of just been like, you know, put me back in place. And I feel like a lot of times the world has a way of doing that for us. Like it, it's almost like, um, you know, the world kind of tells you where you're at at certain points. Um, but there, there was a point, you know, uh, coming out of high school, you know, sometimes, or just coming out of a certain environment, you graduate to like a different environment, you know, for, for me, like going from high school to college was a, was a wake up call because I didn't, I realized I'm in a, a big, you know, where they say you're a, a small fish in a big pond and it's like, okay, you're not all that. Like <laughs> you kind of realize you, you, the whole world changes and you're like, okay, I, I've got a lot to learn. That was one point. And then the other point in time that I, I think I had kind of ego death was like, I, like I told you, and I think you kind of went through it when the, when the gym shut down and it's like, okay, you know, our whole world can change in an instant. Um, and it kind of just like, you know, was a wake up call. So not sure where I'm going with that, but that's, that's what that made me think of with, with the ego thing is just sometimes the world has a way of just checking you at times. And it, 
and it kind of puts you in your place, like kind of kills your ego. Um, but it's being able to to flow and pick yourself back up and, and, and be able to grow from those experiences where I feel like that balance comes into play. So, yeah, no, that that's a great point because sometimes when somebody's ego gets crushed, they make that, they let that define who they yeah. are yeah. instead of saying, okay, this is just a normal process of life that right. your ego is going to get knocked down to size every once in a while. It happens time and time again in the fight game. Yeah. You know, that street fight that I got into as a kid, that was my ego getting, you know, getting checked and yeah. saying like, all right, you're not that tough. You know, there's always going to be somebody bigger and better than you. But yeah. now what are you going to do with this? Are you going to let it, are you going to let it define you and say, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I could have sat there and said, okay, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just a loser. I'm, I'm nobody. And what happens then? You spiral, right? You find these, you know, the self-talk kicks in and you start to define yourself as a loser. So what happens? You start behaving like a loser and it, it can just, you know, spin out of control. So I, I would, I, I say that's a, a, I would say that's a great point that you brought up that, you know, your ego is going to, is going to test your chin. I call it the chin check, right? <laughs> But what are you going to do with it? You know, when it does test your chin. Yeah. And I think it can, it can turn into a, like a defining point in your life. If you come back from it, you know what I mean? Like it, it can turn into actually, you may feel even more confident about that, that comeback than if it didn't happen at all. You know, there, there's certain points in, in my life, like where I've gotten fired from an office job where I, I could have let that, like you said, you know, I could have let that define me. I could have said like, I'm useless. I can't you know, I can't hold a job and things like that, but I turned it into a positive by going all in on my fitness business. Um, and it became the best, the best situation ever. Right. So I think there's certain times when, like you said, if you can turn that into a positive, then it, it can become like something that you're actually very proud of that you came, came back from that moment. So, yeah, the, uh, the word you brought up earlier and I love it because it's something I've always used like fuel, use it as fuel. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think David Goggins, uh, he he says like it's a cookie in the cookie jar. I, I don't know if you've heard it. <laughs> I've heard it. Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Go go back to the cookie jar. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So sweet. So what what I know I'm gonna kind of wrap this one up because I know you're a busy guy. I got stuff to do. Um, and I I know you told me you wrote a podcast recently that went three hours. <laughs> I'm not gonna keep you that long. So, but what what would you like to challenge the listeners? Um that they can do to start elevating every day, you know, get that 1% better. Like you said, every single day, what can they take action on? What's one small thing they can take action on after listening to this? I, I will go back to the self-talk concept because I, I feel like that was a game changer in my life many times. Like I, I lost my gym back during hurricane Sandy in 2012. And that was another time where my self-talk was crucial because you know, as my wife and I were watching Hurricane Sandy destroy our our community and literally drown our gym in six to eight feet of of ocean and bay water, you know, we were crying or we were both emotional. And I told my wife, I remember saying to her, I was like, look, we're going to come back bigger and better than before. Yeah. And just like when I was a kid, I, I didn't know how, I didn't know what we were going to do. But by just having that self-talk, it opened up you know, the universe to us because, you know, we kept thinking, okay, we're going to come back bigger and better than before. So I would say to your listeners, like really challenge your self-talk, really become aware of how you're speaking to yourself because self-talk dictates your life and it's your choice, whether it's self-destruction or whether it's, you know, building yourself, you know, being anabolic, constructing a life that you want. That's awesome. Awesome guys. So start journaling, start, paying attention to your own self-talk. Remember, like Chris said, first step is awareness and then, and then practice better self-talk, you know, treat yourself like you would someone you love. That's what I like to say. You know, it's like, would you treat, you know, your significant other or your own mother? Like, would you, would you speak to them this way that you're speaking to yourself? If not, like, you know, treat yourself that way. Right. Um, awesome. I like that. And, and remember that you can always come back. I think that was a, a recurring theme on this podcast with you, man. So, well, you know, just actually, if I could just add one more thing, like the subtitle of my book is fall seven times, stand up eight. So yeah, you know, getting knocked down 
is a part of this. Like, but yeah. now find a way to pick yourself back up and move forward. Right. Yeah. So whatever you're going through, like there's always a comeback and that makes for a better story, right? It's like in the Rocky movies, it's not like it was always just easy <laughs> and he, and you know, he was always winning. There's always, you know, the downfall or the, the tough part of the story. And that's what makes it a good story. Right. And so I think that's a beautiful part of life. So it's just part of it. Um, awesome, man. So what, what is next for you? Like, what, what are you working on? What, what's kind of, what are you going towards right now? So I'm actually working on a kid's book right now. Uh, I'm going through a, a course on how to put together a kid's book for middle schoolers, uh, where I'm going to incorporate the champ up message. Uh, I don't have all the details yet, but that, I would say that's, that's the next big project, but also keeping, you know, the speaking going and I'm going back to a bunch of schools in the new school year. And I've actually got a conference lined up in California uh, in February of 2024. So keeping speaking going and then, yeah, putting this kid's book together. That's, those are the two missions to, to keep on. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm excited to follow you, see what, see where, where this journey goes with your speaking and everything. I, I know it's going to be awesome. So I'm, I'm excited to follow you on social media and everything. Very cool. Awesome. Um, where can the people find you? Uh, so I would say first place would be go to my website. If you, if you happen to be a decision maker for a school, like if you want to bring in, uh, you know, if you need, if you want to bring in a speaker, uh, go to my website or obviously Instagram and Facebook, uh, you can always find me there too. And, and LinkedIn. Okay. Awesome. I'll put the, I'll put all your socials down in the description and everything. It's very cool. Awesome. Appreciate awesome. it, Kate. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Chris. This was awesome. And thank you to the listeners. Um, I know you got a lot of value out of this. So, you know, the Elevate Everyday podcast is all, all about taking action though. So, you know, use some of what we talked about, put it right into your life, like take action on it immediately. Okay. So <clears throat> guys, expert guests coming on the podcast every single week, like Chris. So stay tuned, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button. I'll see you guys in the next video. And in the meantime, Elevate Everyday. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Kate. Awesome. Peace.